Good morning and welcome to another YouTube sermon. Today, as we continue our series on the book of Isaiah, we're looking at Isaiah chapter 17, verses 12, right through to verse 7 of chapter 18. In other words, right through to the end of chapter 18 from the NIV. Woe to the many nations that rage, they rage like the raging sea. Woe to the peoples who roar, they roar like the roaring of great waters. Although the peoples roar like the roar of surging waters, when he rebukes them they flee far away, driven before the wind like chaff on the hills, like tumbleweed before a gale. In the evening sudden terror, before the morning they are gone. This is the portion of those who loot us, the lot of those who plunder us. Woe to the land of whirring wings along the rivers of Cush, which send envoys by sea in papyrus boats over the water. Go swift messengers to a people tall and smooth-skinned, to a people feared far and wide, an aggressive nation of strange speech whose land is divided by rivers. All you people of the world, you who live on the earth, when a banner is raised on the mountains you will see it, and when a trumpet sounds you will hear it. This is what the Lord says to me. I will remain quiet and will look on from my dwelling place, like shimmering heat in the sunshine, like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. For before the harvest, when the blossom is gone and the flower becomes a ripening grape, he will cut off the shoots with pruning knives and cut down and take away the spreading branches. They will all be left to the mountain birds of prey and to the wild animals. The birds will feed in them all summer, the wild animals all winter. At that time, gifts will be brought to the Lord Almighty from a people tall and smooth-skinned, from a people feared far and wide, an aggressive nation of strange speech, whose land is divided by rivers. The gifts will be brought to Mount Zion, the place of the name of the Lord Almighty. Amen. Let us pray. And now may the word to my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our God and our Redeemer. Amen. The Oracle Against Damascus and Israel, Part 2. There's a very famous video on YouTube that purports to be a test of the viewer's powers of observation. It's a very short bout of basketball and the viewer is asked to work out how many passes one team makes. Then the viewer is asked, did you see the bear? When the video is then played again, you can quite, see, quite clearly see someone dressed up in a bear costume straveying about between the players. It's all a matter of perspective, what you expect to see versus reality. And today's reading is about perspective and perception versus reality. I've called this reading part two because it follows on from last week's reading and it doesn't include a separate oracle of doom against any particular nation. There were two parts to the reading, both of which about seeing the reality beyond appearances. In the first, we're invited to go against our natural instincts when faced with overwhelming odds. In the second, the invitation is to see God at work even if the opposite seems true. So that first bit about overwhelming odds, the many raging nations raging like the sea, roaring like great waters, it's possible that these nations are just mentioned generally. It's the vast and mighty Assyrian forces that were responsible for the destruction of Aram and Israel in last week's reading. Our natural instinct would be to see such forces as nigh on unstoppable. You would need an equal force at least to be able to stop them. After all, they had just, just destroyed two nations. But to think that way is to forget the sovereign power of the living God. When he rebukes those mighty people, we see they aren't a mighty force. They are helpless like chaff or tumbleweed caught up in the wind, and they're gone in almost the blink of an eye. One minute they're mighty, then by the evening they're terrified, then by the morning they are gone. The point is not merely to highlight the power of God, it's to reassure God's people that the living God and his might are on their side. This is the portion of those who loot us, the lot of those who plunder us. Remember that these oracles were composed for the sake of God's people in Judah to encourage them to rely on God and to discourage them from relying on others. There is no foe so mighty that God cannot protect his people from them. So the game is not worth a candle. The second part of our reading, chapter 18 as a whole, isn't quite so simple. In fact, it's so ambiguous that it's hard to tell who is being addressed and what they're being asked to do. I find it's always a bad sign when all the commentaries I go to for 
well, for advice, all disagree with one another. In fact, one of the commentators summed it up in advance with a warning. He quoted yet another much older commentator who said, this is one of the most obscure prophecies in the whole book of Isaiah. Oh, good. To put it in a nutshell, the reading seems to be about telling the people of Cush to send envoys to another nation with a message from God. What's not clear is why single out Cush as envoys or who they're being sent to. It's worse than that because it's not quite clear where Cush was, although it seems to include what we would call Ethiopia, Sudan and Somalia. So why Cush? Well, there's a few possibilities. It might be simply that Cush was so far away that it was effectively the other side of the world to Isaiah. So why not send them far away to people who are already themselves far away? It's also possible, and this is reading quite a lot into the passage, that the Cushites had already sent envoys to Judah, possibly suggesting an alliance. So it was a way of turning those envoys back around and sending them to people who needed them. Yet another possibility is that in Isaiah's time, an Ethiopian was ruling Egypt, and Egypt is the target of an oracle in chapter 19. Whatever the reason for looking to Cush to provide messengers, this isn't an oracle against Cush. They're simply messengers. But to whom are they being sent? To a people tall and smooth-skinned, to a people feared far and wide, an aggressive nation of strange speech whose land is divided by rivers. That could refer to any number of nations or peoples. Personally, I'm convinced by the argument that this isn't any particular nation. It's a representation of all mighty and powerful nations. The message itself is to watch out for a work of God. All the peoples of the earth will be able to see it for themselves when the banner is raised on high and the trumpet is blown. God is about to perform a mighty deed and the world will be a witness to it. As with the first part of this reading, it's about suddenness, about a rapid change of fortunes. Behind the scenes, God is waiting, quietly watching, only noticeable in the subtle way that heat haze or a mist of dew can be noticed. God is portrayed as waiting for the perfect moment that only he, in his infinite knowledge and wisdom, can understand. Then there is what we would call in modern jargon a surgical strike. If you want to know when to prune a grapevine, you ask someone who grows grapes. They know when and how and where to prune their vines. That's how God is portrayed in this reading. At the right moment, he prunes the nations, removing the unfruitful shoots and branches. The shoots and branches from a pruned vine left on the ground for the sake of wildlife. So will the fallen of the nations be left behind after God has struck. It's tempting to see this as a prophecy from the time of King Hezekiah as well as Isaiah, when 185,000 Assyrians were struck down by God. They'd been attacking Judah and Jerusalem. But it's a prophecy with a broader perspective than that. The reason for the surgical strike is not to cow or destroy the nations, but rather to convert them. At the end of our reading, the very same people who receive this message will bring gifts tribute to Mount Zion and the temple of the living God. So it's possible that looking at a reading like this, we're moving well beyond any particular historical moment and any particular historical time. And it, it's become what's technically called an eschatological vision of the end of days. I hope it's clear that both parts of this reading encourage us to see the world differently. In the first instance, there is the case of overwhelming odds. I don't know about you, but I've been feeling a little bit overwhelmed since the beginning of the pandemic. That feeling of losing control, of hidden dangers, of having to be careful about everything all the time. When something can affect the whole world, it's very easy to feel helpless and to be paralyzed with uncertainty and fear. Certainly some days during lockdown, I was going for the motions, not really engaging with anything. But that's the mistake we make when we compare things to ourselves rather than to God. God isn't part of this world, he's not subject to this world, he is sovereign over this world and everything in it. The greatest obstacles and the greatest odds mean nothing compared to the might and the love of God. And remember that that first part is about love as well as power. 
the God who sent his son to die for us is on our side. The God who has the power to raise his son from the dead can change any and all circumstances. But on this is where our second reading comes in. When he knows it's the right time and circumstance to do so. In the second part of our reading, God's activity is like heat haze or faint mist. So faint you have to know in advance that it's even there. <coughs> it's not that God is ever idle, but we lose patience because we can't see God working. We don't recognize it, at least. We're especially impatient when something dreadful is happening and God's handiwork seems to be absent. But that too is an illusion and the proof of those moments when God works unmistakably. That might be in our lives or the lives of others. It might be on the personal scale or something that shifts the balance of the whole world. And remember why God acts in this way. Yes, for his wonderful purposes and for the sake of the plan of salvation and to bring people to faith. The Bible makes it clear that this is the purpose of miracles. For example, God acts out in the open so that humans can heed his message and believe. <coughs> the YouTube video I mentioned earlier is called Test Your Awareness, Do the Test, an awareness test. Today's reading makes it clear that every day is meant to be an awareness test for God's people. Are we aware of God working in our life for the life of our church? Because he is. Are we aware that God loves us with an undying love? Because he does. Are we aware that the love and power of God are supreme over everything that threatens us with despair? Because they are. In all times, in all things and in all places, God is working to heighten our awareness of him and to bring others to a joyful realization of his saving love and mercy and grace. Amen.